As you know, this is the second cycle, as we started last uh, time, last lecture two weeks ago, about the book of Genesis. In fact, this is a, a cycle uh, on uh, biblical history. So we start from the Genesis, book of Genesis, as the first book of the Old Testament, and also as the or initial part of the whole history of mankind and, and the world. So that's why I referred to creation and fall and the consequences that it had later in the act of resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time, we talked more about theology, let's say, in general, like based on the tree. Oh, here is Blagoje Great. So Blagoje, good evening to you as well. I hope you join us at some point soon. I will just give some introductory part. Then if you want, you can turn in physics as the first. Then I will go to biology and the other things. <coughs> so um, the idea for tonight is to touch the points about uh, uh, correlations or the similarities or uh, confrontations between modern sciences, contemporary sciences, and uh, book of Genesis, or let's say theological aspects of the creation. This is something that I suppose most of you are intrigued by and interested in. So that's, uh, I decided to go with this one. And my friend and colleague, Blago Zjordjevic, uh, a physicist, PhD in physics, uh, will help me in this. I particularly uh, asked him to present the parts about cosmology and physics, while I will concern more about evolution and biology. And just the, the point of this uh, tonight's lecture is not just as by now giving a long term talkings and just you are listening to me or to Blago or to anybody else, but just also to try to activate our uh, audience or, or people who are here participating in this lecture to uh, give us some questions or comments so that we can uh, tell something later when you ask us and we pose some questions. That's uh, maybe an even better interaction and way of interaction than just to be speaking beginning to the end. Talking, I mean. Okay, so anyway. And this time, yes, as I say, we uh, will give some evidences from the biblical stories there. Then the interpretation of the Holy Fathers and the understanding of uh, the book of Genesis through the history of Christianity. And uh, as the outcome, how we can find connections or um, not enough of connection with the modern sciences, whatever. As you know, as you might know, uh, I hope at least part of you, maybe all of you, have read the book of Genesis. And in general, like uh, there was over the centuries, uh, the understanding of God's creation in a way that uh, the, the, the sciences of that time could provide. So as we know, uh, the, uh, the level of science in, let's say, ancient time was such that uh, the earth was represented as a plane and that was in the center so that the sun is uh, rotating around the earth. So there was completely different approach and understanding of modern physics and the, all the sciences in a way. And as you know, in ancient time, there was uh, a different uh, concept of sciences so that uh, everything uh, that is, uh, let's say, uh, modern natural sciences came from philosophy, which was in fact a part of the general knowledge, human knowledge in the ancient time, which included uh, various skills and which we say now and call now sciences. And it comprised um, at the same time mathematics, philosophy, theology, and other skills also like arts and uh, logic, which is now part of philosophy. It was different concept of science in the past time, in, in ancient time. Uh, that's the case uh, which even uh, 
our holy fathers also was part of at that time. So what we should say at the first point here, we should not, uh, uh, let's say, uh, regard a book of Genesis as a scientific book. At first, it's a book for our salvation as all Bible and all, both Old Testament and New Testament, which means we at first read uh, something that is important for our existence and for our eternal life. So for, uh, from that point of view, uh, it's uh, why these, all these books of the Bible, both Old and New Testament, were created. So when we read this, uh, the, the parag paragraphs there and the chapters, uh, when we see um, something explained, it is not as an exact science and a, like a scientific statement. So that's the first point that we should be considered of. So um, God is uh, seen as a creator, as omnipotent and uh, as such, uh, who uh, in fact gives us by his, his act of free will, gives us a grant of free will as a, uh, our uh, most important Parting and, and the property. So, uh, as we see in the book of Genesis in the first chapter, when there is a described creation in a way as it is given there, um, we see uh, that it's not given like whether it's like a plane or not, or what kind of uh, uh, existing physics is lying underlying behind that. So, we cannot put the, any kind of like criticism whether uh, in uh, uh, like advantage or disadvantage of this description as given in the first chapter. So uh, that's the point where we cannot say about that. But what we can say here is uh, there are some other things uh, that are more important for us in, in a view, in, in the light of modern and contemporary sciences. Um, okay, let's me, let me just uh, give now way to say something about the physics in general I mean what what's important to know that uh, uh, we have as you know at least part of you or all of you uh, some uh, physical theories modern physical theories and modern cosmology that supports uh, the facts given in the book of Genesis that uh, the world that the, uh, the cosmos is created uh, from like uh, the unique act, which means like from the nothing, from uh, as we say in physics, like from the singularity and it started like expansion. So it's given in a theory of Big Bang, which I give now Blagoy to say more about that. And then we can go into the other things and the other aspects. So Blagoy, please. Let's see. I need to get the share, okay, share screen. So you need to unshare and then I, I can share my I'll unshare this. Oh, you have to en enable it. I think it's enabled, right? I get host disabled participant screen sharing. Yeah, the, the, the easiest way is uh, Miroslav to make Blagway a co-host or to go oh, to... okay. Okay, let me see. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or you can go on the share screen, uh, that arrow up that you have, and then there is advanced options where uh -huh. you, can, you can allow, allow uh, others. Okay, multiple participants can share simultaneously. Okay, so uh, I no, can... No, no, actually, the, uh, I, I don't think for that to work, you need to go to advanced options. All participants. Who can share all participants? Oh, yes. Okay, that's it. Okay, oh, okay. thank you. Thank yes. you, Drago. I think yes. this is Drago, right? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, so okay. I did this. I hope now Blago can... Yes, it started. Good. Okay, so I have a lot of material. I won't cover most of it. Um, Miroslav, do you want... I was going to start with the ancient physics and then go to the modern physics. Is that... Whatever, if you have some brief overview about ancient physics, you can give something more additional, but then we can turn to modern physics. I think that's why people are more in interested for it. <laughs> okay, so um, there's a lot of mythology that's interesting, but I'll skip that. So in terms of like what the church fathers were living in in ancient times, um, 
they had something like science, it's better to call it natural philosophy, um, uh, but they had some ideas that are actually fairly impressive considering the fact that they you know, didn't even have pen and paper, let alone advanced instruments. So for example, um, we have this idea we believe that the ancient Hebrew people believed in a flat earth, although I personally actually have not found any evidence of it. I think there's a lot of assumptions involved in that, but it, it makes sense uh, given their surrounding cultures. Like I had some stuff on uh, surrounding mythologies that suggested a flat earth. However, the ancient Greeks already by the fifth century uh, believed that the world was a sphere. Um, and that uh, was the dominant belief. So that started in the, around 600 and already by the fourth century that became like the status quo for natural philosophy in the ancient world, at least in the Mediterranean. It's actually interesting in China and China, which is also an extremely advanced culture historically, they believed in a flat earth until like the modern era, which is just very interesting that they're able to do what they could despite that. Um, so there's lots of factors. So they believe the earth is a sphere how the land is distributed over the sphere is not clear to them, but they have several theories. Um, they believed in, you know, elements, you know, what everyone knows, earth, fire, water, and air. We think of that as kind of like a cute thing. They took it very seriously and tried to apply it seriously. They had some ideas about atom theory, uh, which is all just conjectures. They don't have, ancient Greeks like to think about things, but they don't like to test their theories. So, you know, they have all these ideas, but nobody's willing to actually test them, let alone have the means to test them. Um, so just to go on this. So, like I said, <coughs> there's good um, evidence that ancient Mediterranean cultures, like super ancient, believed in a flat earth, but at least the Greeks uh, generally accepted a spherical earth. And that was, you know, pretty generally accepted by Christians later on. You know this, like if you live by the water, which most of the ancient Greeks did, that you can see a ship go past the horizon. Uh, I hope you guys can see this image okay. And this is a modern day image of a big boat uh, near the horizon, past the horizon, and that even works for small boats. Um, this was generally accepted by ancient Christians, although there were some people who didn't really care for the idea of a spherical earth. St. John Chrysostom apparently seemed to have like he doesn't directly say, no way, Jose, but he like kind of seems to be somewhat uncomfortable with the idea. Uh, and then there's a famous guy named Cosmos Indicoplastes, and he dismissed, dismissed the idea of a spherical Earth as pagan. However, Byzantine textbooks all describe a spherical Earth. What's interesting about the ancients is that ancient Christians in particular, is even though they accept an ancient Earth, they absolutely refuse to believe that there's the possibility of people living on the other side of the sphere. They said that's not possible. And, you know, that's just, just what they felt like. Um, and it's also interesting that the idea that Christians believed in a flat earth, as opposed to like pre-Christian cultures, seems to have been an American invention. Um, I don't have much evidence uh, for before that. I mean, this you can get from the wiki page and you can look into it yourself. But from my personal experience with Byzantine history and science, at least the ancient or the medieval Greek Orthodox people believed in a spherical earth. And if you want to say people in Russia or Germany or Serbia, Middle Ages, maybe they didn't believe in a spherical earth, but you know, we have to admit, despite using spoons and forks in the Middle Ages, Serbian education probably wasn't as good as it was in Constantinople. Um, likewise, cosmology. Ancient Greeks believed in geocentric universe. They believed the planets and the sun orbited the earth. Um, but the thing is, their calculations were actually very precise for something that you can just use only your eyes for. Uh, <coughs> so ancient Christians are often criticized for having used a geocentric Earth, but it's able to predict you know, the calendar, the seasons very well, uh, particularly if you're used, literally eyeballing it. And there's something called epicycles, and there's a myth saying, um, Ptolemy and the medieval people used epicycles and epicycles and epicycles, but that's actually not true. And the interesting thing about epicycles, I do theoretical physics, and um, an epicycle on a circle is quite literally what we call perturbation theory in modern theoretical physics. You have your general trend, whatever you're studying, and then you pretend there's a little perturbation that you use to modify your system. 
and if you solve certain integrals, you're literally going to get a circle on a circle. So this is exactly what um, epicycles were, uh, ancient form of perturbation theory. So, <coughs> okay, I'll skip this. So modern theory, everyone knows about heliocentrism versus geocentrism. Um, let's see, um, what is particularly interesting here, uh, this is often framed as, you know, a fight between science and religion. This is also completely outside the Orthodox world. This is just in the Protestant and Catholic worlds, this debate. So we kind of just inherited some of that baggage or did not inherit it. Um, but the idea, for example, that Galileo was persecuted is also somewhat a myth. He was told to be in house arrest um, by the Pope in Rome and they didn't like to print his books in Rome, but he, the general ideas specifically attributed to Copernicus, Brahe, and Kepler had pretty much free reign throughout Europe. And what's particularly interesting about these characters is that Brahe and Kepler were actually both Protestants, and they were on the official payroll of the Holy Roman Emperor. That is, you know, the leader of Catholic Europe. So despite, you know, the Pope and Galileo not getting along, um, they were very tolerant of these ideas more so than we portray them. So now we talk about modern cosmology. <coughs> um, something I skipped over that's very interesting is that the idea of the universe being static and eternal, that was an ancient pagan idea that Christians uh, refused to accept. So something I find very interesting about the church fathers who are familiar with the science of their day is there are certain times where they refuse to kind of bend to the scientific conceptions if it really uh, did not mesh with their understanding of Genesis. So for example, Christians believe that the universe is not eternal, it's finite in time and space, um, and it's changing, it's not static, and it came from nothing. But interestingly, with the Renaissance, the old pagan idea, Aristotelian pagan idea of a static eternal universe came back, and that continued into the 20th century. There were some blocks to it. For example, Olber's paradox, which the classical idea was that there's infinite space, infinite time, and also infinite matter. But however, if you have infinite matter, that means you have infinite stars. If you have infinite stars, then that means there's no dark sky. So here's a little cartoon of that. So that put a break on one of the old pagan ideas, uh, which actually people try to bring back despite their supposed Christian dispositions. <coughs> um, Herschel is famous for mapping the Milky Way. This is a picture of the galaxy mapped by him. Uh, this is borrowed from Zarya Lukic. If you guys know him, he's a smart guy who goes to the San Francisco church. Um, but really what in the 20th century, where um, things, our understanding of cosmology kind of start to expand is the fact that we looked at certain stars and they looked very fuzzy. They weren't very clear, like circles, like the sun was. We call them nebulas, nebulae. Uh, we didn't know what they were. We assumed they were just gas clouds. However, um, Edwin Hubble is one of his several discoveries is that he concluded that those gas clouds some were literally just gas clouds. We still call them nebula today, uh, but some of them are galaxies. So he concluded that the universe wasn't composed of just stars in our galaxy, but galaxies and galaxies and galaxies. So that's a big change in our understanding of cosmology that occurred in the modern era. Likewise, what he's most famous for is discovering that the universe is expanding. <laughs> so here's a diagram that he made where he shows here, okay, I think I don't need, Oops, no, I'm sorry. Um, so in the diagram, he shows a very clear linear relationship, a straight line between um, the distance to the star, which he estimates by the, uh, by, uh, the brightness and the velocity of the star as it goes away. And so this is a cartoon made by Zarya, how he shows that, let's say we are at this red point, and he shows that uh, stars closer by to us are moving a further away at a slower speed than stars further away. And so this is called Hubble's law, a very simple relationship. The velocity of the star is proportional to the Hubble constant times its distance. 
and this is estimated to be around 70 kilometers per second per mark my megaparsec today and a megaparsec is a very big distance it's 10 million trillion miles so nothing you're going to be able to walk <coughs> another big development in cosmology is um as everyone is familiar with is um einstein's theories and in particular general relativity special relativity is more of like a a culmination of many ideas that many people had thought of before, but general relativity was a real kind of jump. Um, and so <coughs> the idea is that, you know, space time, the relationship between points is not a flat surface, it's curved. And one physical um, implication of this is uh, the bending of space and time. So here is a cartoon of an important experiment where uh, a light from the star is bent around the sun towards Earth. And that was uh, observed in 1919. Uh, this is a cartoon of a black hole from the movie Interstellar, mediocre movie, but this is an excellent, excellent visualization. Um, what's interesting about Einstein in this case is that he actually, uh, despite being Jewish, you know, Jewish people also by faith are supposed to believe in a uh, world created out of nothing, he actually wanted to have an eternal static universe. And he actually got upset when several people started to use his equations and demonstrate that you know the universe wasn't static or eternal, that it had a beginning and it could have an end. So one fellow is named uh, Alexander Friedman, wrote these simple equations. Getting them is very complicated, but you can reduce them to the simple form. And this suggests that the universe is either expanding or contracting. <coughs> so what Einstein does is he adds something called the cosmological constant. You might hear that if you watch pop science videos about expansion, and he just tacks on that term here, multiplying it by the metric here, g mu nu. And he actually kind of does this arbitrarily, although some other people like De Sitter also tried to do it. And he was able to get a static universe that is extremely unstable. So it's as if by putting uh, this lambda term in his equation, he had the universe standing still but on the top of a point. So any little bump to it, it would fall down to either expanding or collapsing. Um, some important effects from modern physics <coughs> that further define this kind of debate is that um, they observed that the light from uh, distant stars was what we call redshifted. And the analogy is pretty close to what we call the Doppler effect in sound. And so what happens to light is what happens to sound essentially. As an ambulance approaches you, you hear this very high pitch noise, and but when it's going away from you, you hear this low pitch noise. So the wave is getting stretched or compressed. And the same thing happens with light waves. So we are seeing stars moving away and we're seeing that their color is slightly redder than we expect them to be. And so that gives us the idea <coughs> that they're moving away and expanding at a faster rate. Uh, an important contributor and the founder of the Big Bang Theory is this Jesuit priest named Georges Lemaitre, this fellow here. Okay, so this is Einstein, everyone knows. This is Friedman, and this is Lemaitre. This is a cool picture of him wearing his cassock in front of a physics board. Um, although interesting, Einstein still, over 10 years later, was still not happy about these changes. So like in 1927, 12 years after he came up with his theory, he said to Lemaitre, the first time they met, your calculations are correct, but your f insight is a tout a fait um, uh, amidable, utterly abominable. So, you know, that's not very polite, but I don't know. He eventually kind of recants a little bit, but I think he's still kind of, he remains kind of uncomfortable with the idea that <coughs> the universe, according to his own equations, is not static and eternal, which is kind of an example of scientists kind of preserving their own prejudices. People like to paint religious people as having their prejudice, their worldview, but there's also a lot of sort of assumptions that we take for granted from us as scientists as well. Okay, and this curve here is an exact copy of uh, the one of the, of the curves that Lemaitre made in one of his early pep papers. So he sees the universe, you know, very simplified toy model of the universe. It grows and it collapses it grows and then kind of flattens out, and here it grows and expands. And so this is kind of like the theoretical basis for modern Big Bang Theory. And uh, Lemaitre's theory is kind of culminated in 1927. Uh, what's kind of cute is that other people who proposed the steady state universe or the static eternal universe, like Fred Hoyle, 
and they kept on going. And uh, we get the term Big Bang Theory from a radio interview in 1949 between Hoyle and somebody else. And he kind of like dismissively calls Lemaitre's theory that this Big Bang idea. And so that's why we get the name. It's kind of cute. Um, in terms of modern physics and understanding cosmology, <coughs> most investigations depend on these three pillars the recession velocity of the galaxy, how fast galaxies are moving away from us, which we already touched upon, although there's more modern techniques to understanding it, uh, the existence of cosmic microwave background, which I'll get to in a second, as well as the abundance of elements, like what percentage of the universe is this element or that. Those are the three measures or how we attempt to understand cosmology today. And then two big problems that are, I've never studied, so I can't speak to them, um, neither studying in class nor as a researcher, um, is our dark matter and dark energy. But loosely speaking, um, if anybody knows better, feel free to jump in. Dark matter essentially accounts for the invisible attractive forces. And one example of this is that when we look at galaxies and we see how they spin, um, we see them spin so fast that we expect them to kind of throw off stars, throw off matter. But instead, they stay stable, moving at such fast speeds. And so we <coughs> are guessing that there's this invisible dark matter, dark because we can't observe it, that is keeping all, this, uh, all these stars from being thrown out and pulling them in. And then dark energy uh, plays into the cosmological constant and it explains why the universe is expanding at the rate it does, uh, which is also a problem because based on the observable matter uh, we can see, uh, we would expect the universe to actually be slowing down in its expansion and maybe even collapsing, but instead we're seeing it expand even at an accelerating rate. So these are kind of two huge questions in modern physics. And Zaria Lukic from San Francisco, he works on uh, observing, he does like some big data analysis study of uh, mappings of the uh, cosmological, uh, like, what does he work? He works specifically, I think, on the recension of galaxies, I think or at least one of the PIs he works with is very famous for that. I'll come back to that in a second. Yeah, that's right, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> touch upon it here. So the cosmological microwave, I'm oh, sorry, the cosmic microwave background, or short CMB, they'll say CMB a lot, was actually predicted fairly early on, 1948, but there was actually almost 20 years before it was observed. And so the basic idea is that um, if the universe is expanding, that means in the past it was denser and hotter. So this is just like basic thermodynamics. Like if you have um, a hot kettle full of steam and then you pull off the lead, the steam will expand and cool. <coughs> and so the basic principle, that same principle kind of roughly describes what's going on here. So they're trying to take what they think the temperature would be and Herman and Alpha actually predicted five Kelvin and they actually corrected it to um, I think 30 Kelvin a few years later, but it turns out that uh, the observed CMB was actually closer to the original prediction of 5.8 Kelvin. And for those who don't know, Kelvin is a measure of absolute zero. So zero Kelvin means the coldest temperature possible. And so five Kelvin is proportional to, is equal to you know, about uh, minus 270 Kel uh, Celsius, so very small. The other uh, thing that's a uh, measure is Big Bang nucleosynthesis. We believe in the first few minutes of the Big Bang, all the matter was created. Okay, you just pet me. Um, and what we see today is that the universe is about 75% hydrogen, 24% helium, and then 2% everything else. And this is an example of the uh, element abundancy curves. <coughs> These are all divided by the abundancy of hydrogen. So hydrogen is one, helium is this curve here, and then all subsequent elements are down here. So almost the entire universe is hydrogen helium. So you could make some cute analogy to um, how the many creation myths are based on water. So hydrogen is born of water, but I want to do that right now. And the last topic, which we've already discussed, but is more um, kind of refined now, is the recession of stellar objects. Um, and uh, Saul Perlmutter from UC Berkeley, he got the Nobel Prize for this. And what he did that was unique is that um, he found strong evidence of the accelerating expansion by observing and mapping out what are called type one supernovae. And these are called standard candles because we believe that they all 
occur at the same brightness. And what how this works is that you actually have two stars circling each other and like I think a surprisingly large percentage if not a majority of stars are in binary pairs. I can't remember that fact myself. What happens is that the mass from one star gets absorbed onto the other and it kind of gently feeds this star until it gets to the point that it saturates and explodes. So it's a very like controlled detonation of the star. That's why we say it's a standard candle. And this actually is an assumption made by Herschel for normal stars uh, over two centuries ago. Herschel was wrong, of course he had no way to know, but it's interesting that the same kind of approach used a long time ago is still has some validity today in a slightly different context. So um, formation of planets, I'll just quickly go over this. Uh, so in the Genesis, you know, God makes the earth um, and how that happens according to modern theories is that a star, inside a star um, has something called fusion. So atoms, a very energetic, atom, energetic atoms hit each other and combine and fuse. Uh, the basic material being hydrogen and hydrogen builds up until it gets to heavier and heavier elements. And at one point, the core of the star will become, I'm not sure if it's totally iron or just a significant percentage of iron, but at this point, it is no longer able to sustain its traditional uh, fusion process. And it kind of, at first, I think it, it first collapses because the heat pressure from the fusion decreases to the point that it can no longer fight gravity. And so it collapses and then it kind of blows out. And that's what's called a nova. A supernova is when it can uh, pass this past, I think, the um, quantum degeneracy pressure, but it's uh, a little bit more complicated, so we won't talk about that. And so what happens is this iron core, the star blows up, these heavy elements get thrown out into the universe, and then eventually they get collected by another star, and around that star form rings, accretion disks, or at least how we theorize, and those accretion disks slowly build up into planets. And so that's why the sun, uh, the Earth today, for example, the surface is mainly oxygen and silicon, and we believe the core is made of iron. So that's a, a theory for how planets are made. And lastly, modern uh, theory I, is actually closer to what I do, is um, like, like modern understandings of how you create matter out of nothing. <coughs> uh, one very simplistic experiment is called the Casimir effect, and that's when you have two metal plates very close together, like a few um, like microns or no much smaller than microns very close together and then fluctuations quantum fluctuations in the vacuum field between those two causes an attractive force so that means we never actually have a pure vacuum we have quantum fluctuations throughout the entire universe so i kind of found like is this you know revenge of the ether the this kind of discouraged idea from the past and what's uh, interesting about this idea is that you can kind of can extend that to the generation of photons. <coughs> Although I, I don't have, I didn't have enough time to create a blurb about that. But going from photons, you can then take photons and create matter. And this is actually an experiment we're trying to do. And what you do is you take two very high energy photons, very intense light, you hit them together, and then it will create matter and antimatter. We can already do the opposite um, uh, reaction where we combine antimatter matter and we create light. So we're just doing it in reverse. And so we believe that could be what was the state of the universe at the very beginning of time where with the Big Bang happened, the singularity, and then we created a lot of photons and the photons condensed into matter. So kind of creating matter out of nothing. Okay, so that's all Miroslav if you want to take over. Thank for you very much, Thank you so much for a splendid uh, representation of uh, modern contemporary cosmology. Since this took some time, uh, I recommend now to stop at this point and then I can give my part of lecture next time so that we have now some time for discussion all these details that Blagoje present to us. As we can see in general what he intended to say here, we have a theory, at least now valid theory at this point, uh, which comes in accordance with what we have in uh, uh, book of Genesis, that there is creation of the matter ex nihilo, we have creation from one singularity, from one point, and we have the expansion of cosmos. There on, we have some evidences also in the matter of galaxies and of the light that we have as a signal, which we have as the evidence of the getting the distances between galaxies and the increasing the distances. 
at the same time, yeah, we, we can mention many, many other arguments here, not enough time for everything, such like uh, there is also chirality of uh, the particles, which caused also the chirality in the molecules subsequently created uh, as uh, the, the life was created on the Earth. And uh, which means like, uh, what's the organization of the molecules on the carbon, since carbon is four valence, as you know, four bonds. And there are, uh, if you have four molecules, four atoms connected to one carbon atom that creates a molecule, there is uh, different ways, two different ways, which have, which gives eventually two molecules, which uh, refer to each other as uh, the two hands, let's say two human hands, like uh, left and right side, which like a mirror, symmetry but we see on the earth i mean in, in uh, all the living matter there is uh the vase dominance uh, of one only d so-called d or the, uh it's said like uh, dexter and Leighton, which means like uh, right hand side or like right hand <laughs> molecules in, in uh uh in contrary to the left arrangement. So there is something that also gives uh, a raise to the evidence of intelligent design of something that is not like we have many things that uh, it's better to say okay it's just uh, kind of statistical errors. There, there are many things uh, happening during the, this act of creation or during whatever as we can say the creation of the matter and the world which uh, would be ascribed only to statistics and uh, which has a very low probability of occurrence. And when you have uh, accumulation of many such events, it's hard to say that, uh, how come uh, uh, among like, let's say 10 to some uh, degree, like 10 to the million or whatever options, we have that one which one by one in accumulation gives at the end uh, such intelligent design as it's like a human being. The other point is also another hypothesis. Also, now you don't have time to, so much to discuss everything in the detail. It's uh, given by a famous physicist who got also Nobel Prize uh, in the 70s, Ilya Prigozhin, who postulated that uh, the existence of uh, highly organized systems such as human being is far from the thermodynamical equilibrium. And in physics, like in the, it's a main principle that uh, that thermodynamics, like the, let's say how we, I guess most of you have some basic knowledge about that, uh, tends to go into equilibrium into state of the lowest le lowest level of energy and the highest level of entropy, or let's say disorder in the system. That's something that's favored in the nature. Uh, in opposite to that, we have our organic systems, living systems, which are far from that. They're highly organized and with a very high level of energy. That's, for instance, our human being as well. So there are a lot of things now that we can discuss, but I would like you to ask some questions, pose some questions, please take part in this discussion. I just want to caveat, so like my field of physics is really just this picture here, some of the other things I studied, so you can take what I say with a grain of salt, but this is generally the general understanding of these concepts, so if anybody knows better, feel yeah, free to correct. Same to me, well, both Blago and me, we are not, like, say, experts in cosmology, but this is not the point, as Blago, you know as well, it's not the point just to say so much details for the people who may not be like experts in physics, whatever, all of you, but in general, the, the point is just to have an overview uh, of what the, the general problem is. We have something that, uh, uh, apart from this, I must mention something else, uh, physical theory in general, uh, one uh, theory in, in, in sciences, in natural sciences, when we speak on sciences, I, I say mostly about natural sciences. Uh, when we say something like theory in a natural science, such as physics is, there is, a, let's say, a governing or leading theory, which is like now the paradigm of physics. Right now, it's a big bang. It doesn't mean that it, the, 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 the reality which physics describe is only the one which is given by theory. Theory is the, let's say, approximation, the closest at that time to the facts we have from our measurements. And all the reality the physics get, uh, and uh, let's say, uh, formulates comes from the measurements comes from the evidence from the experiment and then the theory is designed or developed in order to 
um, let's say, uh, make the accordance between the uh, facts coming from the experiment. Or theory can also give, uh, be given as a proposal to some kind of uh, discrepancy and uh, let's say theoretical physicists give that the theory which gives description to some phenomenon. And then later on they are looking for the evidence from the experiment that to support this, what they find. So uh, that's uh, also given in a book of Thomas Kuhn, which I recommend to you to read if you have some time. Uh, by the way, what's the, what's the term in English? Uh, it's like... Uh, uh, it's like the theory of si scientific revolutions. Theory of scientific revolution. They, I, just, like I, I mean, the first world, yeah. Uh, it, in general, it goes about uh, scientific revolution. How one uh, leading theory, actual theory, is changed by another, which uh, in the time gets better fitting to the reality which we get from measuring and from observances. So that's how now Big Bang exists. It doesn't mean that it's uh, once and forever. Some other theory can get, can be proven as better so that we can later in future accept this or this one. But at this point we can say, okay, what modern contemporary physics say is not in a confrontation with the creation of a God. But only physics would not be saying about who or what caused the creation from like, nothing from the single point so please now your questions are welcome your comments whatever uh if i need to unmute people no, no, we can we can unmute ourselves i kept i, I hope so yes anyway so thank you thank you both for for this uh, kind of very uh, here is another one physicist so let me introduce drago is for anybody who doesn't know it's great that you're here with us together drago so please give some questions comments uh, whatever so th this is kind of a very fascinating uh, thing for me in general and i i think um uh, of it quite often and how people like to say sometimes that they 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 cannot reconcile uh physics or science uh, and uh, religion and that was kind of the case for for us growing up back uh, in the socialist uh, system where where it was said that that the science is uh, has given all the answers that we need and the only kind of peasants in the villages in the mountains are are kind of uh, the religion is for them however the more you you study the science first of all a couple of points first of all we know so little even about all of this that we've shown and you have shown uh, shows maybe to a degree uh, explains uh, observations or or quantifies observations but uh, why things happen why do positive and negative particles attract why do why do uh, uh, the the different uh, different uh, um, objects of different mass uh, attract each other? Uh, so so all of these things we still don't know, and uh, and a lot of we have only just scraped the surface of the of the things, and uh, and I think that that. Uh, when you see some of these things and some of the to me let, like let's say repetition in in the form general format or patterns say if you look at um, the the uh formulas for for the basic ones so starting just people that people are familiar with the gravity and the and maybe the the uh coulomb force the the their similarities and and how they look to me tell that kind of something has kind of put these things aside. Like then also like the number E, number pi, where they show up and how many things they, they, uh, they come, come up uh, and uh, complex numbers, all these things seem to me that, that, that they're working so well and they're, they're so well, so to say, designed that it cannot be that it's just kind of a matter of chance that all of this framework for the universe have, has been just uh, set up in, in, in such a way that, 
yeah. than like to the something that we can now discuss and be, be aware of these things and discuss yeah. like the complexity as you said i like that point and i and i I've, I've thought of that a lot of time when you when you multiply these probabilities the probability is something something happening like that even in the such a large universe is so small and uh, and so i'll let someone else speak i can i can probably spend uh, hours uh, of uh, discussing this yeah thank you drago thank you just as a recapitulation of what you say is like the point that uh, most of physical theories are given in such elegant and simple formulations right no matter like that it's like long uh, complicated formulas that go behind it where it's very rare in general, you see it's extremely simple and elegant. It's some kind of logarithmic laws or some kind of very, very simple at the end. Very right. Simple. And besides that, like, um, yeah, we see that uh, it, it goes also in some kind of, uh, let's say, um, in, uh, approximations. So we have, like, uh, let's say, <laughs> mechanics, which is classical mechanics, in fact. It's just kind of approximation of general mechanics and we see it on Earth, but far from Earth, it not it doesn't obey to the same laws as classical way. It's like the general, more general physics. It's like quantum physics and so on. And so we see uh, that what we if have you been, go to quantum physics, that's another. Yeah, in fact, we, we, we for centuries and like up to now, we can operate still with some very uh, let's say basic or, or small part of the general physics, which is like very valid, and very. Uh, good enough. Uh, the constraints uh, of the, the constraints of the microscopic world. But far from us, and in, in, in most of uh, the ga galaxy and in most of uh, matter in general, we do not have the same laws that are given uh, in the mechanics that we know, that we experience in everyday life. Right. So we can say almost whole physics that it's uh, like uh, bound to the earth is a very small part of the physics which is valid for the rest of like out right. of the earth so th there are many things that we should be aware of and it, it, it's very com complex approach when you see this all um so from one point of uh, one side i don't want just to bother people with this so many things and so many details but um uh, this uh, from one side uh, uh, complexity of the problem and from the other side very, very uh simple and in the elegance in, in uh, the very theories of the physics gives us some kind of uh, double approach in this. So, yeah. Right. Some, someone or something had to kind of put these things, like, it's, it's very difficult also. The problem is that, that, sure. that we are trying to comprehend something that's incomprehensible. And so we always have to reduce it to our, or simplify it in our heads to kind of, uh, to yes. put our, our, our own, uh, kind of experience and and a little bit of ourselves into into kind of trying to imagine like the god or concept of, of something like that which is yeah. which is why kind of we we are bound to oversimplify it. yeah exactly but i'm i'm wondering if other people so it doesn't it doesn't end up uh, only yeah us, just a discussion like, among three i wonder when, <laughs> yeah. whether anyone anyone has a problem or or thinks that there is uh because for me, I don't, I don't. I, have I raised my hand for a while here now. <laughs> oh, oh. oh yeah, please, please, uh, yeah. But it didn't show. Yeah, it didn't show up. Oh. Uh, oh yeah, it, it's just me now. I, I, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Oh. There is on a participant list. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay, so. okay, okay. So there is there. I like to use this. Um, like there is a, something in the something like. Uh, not that all the rest of the people yeah. are just sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> no, so, of course, yeah. Anna Slav. Oh, what I wanted to add, um, I like how Blagoe mentioned the point that the universe is made mostly of hydrogen and so water, H2O, and same as with human body. I like to tell my patients all the time to drink their water. I'm always drinking it. <laughs> so, Pellegrino this time. But anyway, um, so cells in our body over 70% of water so important to drink water uh, we don't know why that is but that's just how we're made so it's interesting that the universe and then the humans so and that was something yeah, else yeah, that's, to add. that's uh, another another pointer to me that kind of like a bunch of water 
and we have all these kind of thoughts and, uh, it's and so uh, mighty peculiar that it's that way yeah it's not a coincidence right right and uh and, and basically, so, so the, the question that I, that I had is like, like, is there anyone that, that has a, a kind of problem or trouble kind of reconciling kind of the science and, uh, and kind of uh, religion? Because there are, there are kind of denominations that, that, that uh, adapt or, or not adapt, but uh, accept the, the, the book of Genesis or the Bible quite literally and kind of very rigidly. And, and are unable to kind of, they have to kind of choose uh, kind of uh, and say, oh, no, I cannot accept science. I just, for me, it's, it's perfectly, perfectly uh, uh, compatible. Yeah, at this point, maybe just a very quick, uh, brief uh, thing to say. Uh, um, what we can see now and what we can pose is uh, whether there is a conflict between science and theology or there is some kind of uh, uh, like, uh, let's say, interceding or whatever, in, uh, uh, intercommunion. Uh, definitely from this point, which we have heard tonight and which is the point of this lecture, it, there is no conflict. We should not see it as a conflict. On the other side, we don't need to say that, okay, like physics is same like theology or theology is same like physics. There's not such kind of like intermixing or whatever. But what we can see from uh, the results of modern physics that we can see uh, God kind of seeing God, let's say approaching to God through his creation. And physics as itself just talks about the creation, the created world. It doesn't go in that aspect of God's existence or the consequences, whether it's created by God or not, or something like that. So it's uh, very important to make a distinction about that. So when we speak about physics, we just speak about the created world. And so to Drago's point, yeah. I kind of have a problem with it in a way. And that's, this is what I do for, at least this is what I'm paid to do. So I just like, um, <coughs> Like, so the book of Genesis has this very short, weird thing. For example, light is made on the first day, but sun is made on the third or fourth day. So there's these inconsistencies. And then there's all these things like well, the vast majority of saints in the church, you know, people we believe to be touched by God, um, advocate to not take a very literary or uh, allegorical approach to Genesis although they do advise that, you know, this is beyond our comprehension. So, you know, that's kind of a struggle for me. Um, and I don't know. So like some caveats for me, just like, <coughs> like, I don't, I don't think we as scientists should view the Bible as fairy tales or something. We should very insistently, um, you know, tell ourselves, at least this is what I tell myself, you know, this is beyond our comprehension. Um, and, you know, when Christ spoke to Moses or, you know, God spoke to Moses, did he tell him what he needed to know? Did he tell him how it was? I mean, that's not something we can know ourselves either. Um, I guess one kind of loophole for me when I tell myself is that, you know, the world we live in today is not the world of paradise. It's the world, it's the fallen world. The world we live in today is a consequence of sin. And, you know, the Orthodox, I think, you know, Orthodox are very lazy general, lazy speaking, but uh, something we, I think we do very be much better than a lot of people is that we kind of understand the cosmological consequence of Adam's failure. Um, like, you know, when Adam ate the fruit, apple or whatnot, you know, he broke creation. And, you know, so like the Catholics like try to like play games, like, is there a, an original Adam or is there like a, an atomic community somewhere that gains sentience. <coughs> uh, but, you know, the orthodox approach, for me at least, is to kind of like be very childish and ins insist that like these are things we cannot know. All we're seeing is creation after the fall. Because, you know, creation uh, before the fall and in, you know, the second coming, um, you know, entropy doesn't work in creation before the fall or after Christ comes back, you know, you know, you know, you spend energy, you have to go to the bathroom, all these things have to happen that, you know, can't really happen 
when everything is perfect. Um, so, but so I don't know. I, I, I do think it's important to understand like the physics we are seeing today is the work of God, but it's also a little bit broken. And in terms of, you know, our store understanding of salvation. And I always like to remind myself of like the two proverbs, um, you know, trust in God with all your heart and lead on and on your, your own understanding. And then also, I think it's important for like scientists to always remind themselves, you know, God fearing scientists, you know, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so, you know, if we keep those in mind, we can stay humble. Um, <laughs> and like someone mentioned quantum mechanics, that's like, I think we're kind of approaching, at least in physics, partly because we're, we're, we're poor and we're like desperate for money. Um, and we're kind of reaching this kind of threshold where we're like not really being creative anymore. And that kind of reflects the end of the 19th century when people saying, you know, we already figured out physics, you don't need to study this anymore. That's literally what um, uh, Max Planck's uh, advisor in grad school told him, you know, are you sure you want to do this? We already figured it all out. And then Max Planck, you know, figures out, he discovers quanta and starts the beginning of quantum mechanics. So I feel like modern science is kind of, has the kind of hubris of pre-Planck science. And I at least see that in my field, at least, and my field is, you know, not exactly the most famous of field, plasma physics. Um, so, I don't know. For me, it's not a simple question, and I don't feel, I think generally as Christians, you know, if you get comfortable, then you might need to think you're doing something wrong. So as, you know, a scientist, you know, I'm not paid to think about these things. I need to put bread on the table, although, you know, Christ says, you know, man does not live on bread alone, but, um, so I don't know. Uh, th this is something I struggle with, and, um, so that's why I was smirking earlier because I wasn't trying to embarrass anyone else. I was talking about myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Drago, yeah, please. So, so no, I, I, I agree with with the with the with the points uh, that that and the, that there are inconsistencies uh, and the world. So, so what I said, uh, I didn't say that that when I said I didn't struggle, struggle or, or I didn't don't see uh, incompatibilities is is the is having one exclude another or be directly contradictory to another yes there are there are things that you can you can say kind of like the, the thing that stuck that you said like created light first and then the sun it doesn't it doesn't that doesn't uh, for me at least kind of i have the the the, the light and the waves and then when the sun, the sun uh, is yeah, Drago, if I may, can I add to this, that's a good point. I also want to say that there is a point of view that we can say, like, uh, when God, is, uh, in the beginning, God creates uh, uh, heaven and earth, as it is said in the first verse, uh, which means not necessarily to mean earth as the earth, the planet of earth. Material, but like, matter. Uh, heavenly world and the earthly world, or like, let's say, uh, spiritual reality, like angels and archangels, and uh, the created matter. So that's the kind of uh, understanding this here. Later Isn't on, that kind of putting which... our understanding onto God? Like, so, like, this is what I was trying to say, like, science is an opportunity to kind of, like, you know, appreciate, you know, the power of God. You know, we can see it in these great majestic things, but, you know, I think we also need to be humble and, like, admit, you know, if God, if we truly believe in an all-powerful God, somebody yes. who knows everything, who knows, you know, the individual quanta of our being, you know, for him, it's not a challenge to make the world in six days if he wants to. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. that is something, you know, and, you know, that is something that, you know, could get you fired. At least I work in a lab, you know, people at least look me funny um, to say such things. But, you know, it, I think it's important to like, you know, have that humility. You know, we do live in a world and, you know, order is you know a good thing you know i didn't show you guys but if you look at compared different creation mythologies compared to the bible the bible is very ordered ancient greek mythology is a mess it's like a, a riot it's horrible but you know the genesis is clear order and order is good and so you know god yeah, would want to make an ordered universe we, exactly we don't know how the modern let's say the, the physics the existing physics is put in reality how it's created and like start let's say we don't know whether it happened in six days or this or that. We, like, based on, on, on 
what we now can detect and measure and, and say about physics. We cannot say, okay, this was like in the six days. Uh, based on, on God's uh, power and, and uh, let's say uh, capability of creating the soul, there is no limitation, as you say, as we can say in general. There is no limitation whether we must say, oh, God must obey to his laws, which he created. Definitely not. He does not. If he has to obey to something that he created, then he is not God. The other point is like when you say, what kind of physical law were existing or like in, uh, let's say, in a law were before the fall? Whether it was the same uh, classical approximation or not, whether there was something else or not, uh, whether there was like obeying to the principles of entropy and thermodynamics and everything else, and in which way. It's also a matter of kind of secret. We cannot say this was like this or not or the other way. So that's something that still gives uh, God attributes of his omnipotence. So, possibility to do whatever he wants, whatever way he, he chooses. So the, the point is just not to ascribe to God some kind of uh, criteria of necessity or criteria of uh, obeying to something. God is like with no limitations in his will and his uh, uh, manifestation, whatever he's acting and everything else. Like uh, similar, like we, we, which we can see in, in the created world, how we say for the cosmos, for everything created, like for the, uh, it's like uh, cosmos is unlimited. There is no limitations, no limits, but it's uh, finite, not infinite, right? So that's something that's also a bit kind of uh, hard to understand. Because when you say, okay, this is uh, limited, there is a dimension of cosmos. We can say about it's 10 to the 40 or whatever, but how can we say, Okay, what's out of that? Right. Yeah, that's that's that's. Those that's a tricky question. Nice. Then we can say, okay, again, like kind of analogies. Okay, we have maybe a track or what's say like how many uh, surfaces we have. We have just one when we just take uh, like a piece of paper, cut out it, and then just properly join them, and then we get just one surface. So anyway, this kind of analogies. I mean, we cannot just. Uh, copy paste to some realities in physics but it's a way how we can try to imagine something how cosmos is unlimited but finite and how god's existence is the same way uh, with no limitations for what he can do or not or so Stevan, Stevan, you're usually very talkative <laughs> uh oh Stevan is here yeah oh, yeah is, am i on am, is my mute off or not no, you're not mute. You're you're unmuted. Uh, okay. You, you, I, I mean, I'm enjoying the listen here. The the one part that is interesting is well, I remember studying Genesis a while back, and first of all, you have to realize that Genesis actually the, the first four books were actually written by four different authors, and Genesis <laughs> chapter one and Genesis chapter two were written by two different people, two different authors, uh, and and as a result, they reflect creation from two different perspectives. Uh, but that wasn't the part I was getting into. I am find myself often confronted with many atheists, sometimes agnostics, who try to drive this wedge between this concept of there's a separation between God and science. And I always start out by the premise that says there is no disconnect between God and science. There is only misunderstandings of, of, of God or science. Yeah, that's what I was kind of, kind of getting at. And, and, and they always sit there. No, no, no. It's, it's, here's an inconsistency. I, and, and, and it's kind of interesting that, well, ever an, an uh, to me, the recently, you know, I mean, the concept of dark energy and dark matter is relatively recent in, our, my, in my lifetime. That's how old I am. Uh, there was no concept of dark energy or dark matter when I was growing up. But it, it's clearly this concept of, you know, when we read, uh, and, you know, the, the world visible and invisible. And is a confirmation that there's stuff that's invisible. We simply don't know. And so I like, I, I start out with the premise that science and, and um, faith, science and God, is there is no incompatibility. There's only misunderstandings. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Blagoy brought up uh, uh, Einstein's frustration with the cosmological constant, which I thought was an interesting way. It was like, well, if I don't have an answer, then I'll shove something in here to make it work for me. I mean, that's that's our evolution. To me, you know, we're constantly. To me, it was in grad school. I think when I first had 
the realization, and it actually, I think it was a Navier Stokes equation on the board, and we were going through it and marking it up, and all of a sudden we reached a point and the whole colla equation collapsed. And it was at that point, it almost felt like the hand of God was in the equations. So I tend to say that I see God in the equations. Exactly. That's, that's, that's what I was saying earlier. Yeah. yeah. Now, that's a hard thing for a large majority of the world who are, A, not mathematical, resent mathematics, and have no clue on right. the science of mathematics, which is my beef on the Serbian church education of its priests. But that, well, that's the, probably a separate topic altogether. Uh, <laughs> All right, next speaker. <laughs> well, I think uh, uh, Nicola had uh, a question to ask. Nicola, please, uh, if you still are interested to, to question, to, to ask us or whatever. Uh, uh, yeah, we are actually uh, running 50, uh, 15 minutes, you know, over time. So I don't want to yeah, you just we, we have something. Yeah. So, so I, I just wanted to add. Uh, I think you actually mentioned this uh, 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 crea uh, uh, creationists, uh, uh, mostly from the pro pro Protestant uh, denominations, who were trying to literally uh, explain uh, like six days, meaning like six times twenty-four hours. And and they were they they have a really good a network of this uh, materials of uh, like videos or books or uh, with um, evidences especially in geology from their point of view those layers and and uh, stuff. So I wanted to ask you guys um, as a, a expert. So um, are there um, like uh, evidences or proofs are they um, like um, valuable if you know what I mean so they're you know they, they are trying to uh, prove that uh, that was literally happening as it was uh, um, uh, written in uh, Genesis so if if anybody can can just uh, expand on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Blago, maybe you first, if you want to go first. Um, I mean, I, I guess I, I'm not, I haven't followed them too much. I mean, I try to make my point that, you know, I think, you know, we need to be humble and accept the possibility that is part true because, you know, it's in God's power to do that. Although in terms of evidence, I don't know much about the geological layers. I mean, you know, there's, there are still flat earthers today and, you know, I, I tried to briefly show that that actually was not really a general orthodox belief. It's kind of surprising it comes back. And there's simple disproofs for that. Um, I mean, intelligent design is generally gets a bad rap. And I think uh, in terms of a strong scientific principle and theologically, I think some people, and I feel like sometimes when they do that and trying to justify Genesis, they are actually, again, trying to force Genesis into some sort of natural understanding, which again, you know, it's kind of, it's in that case, science still wins. So it's kind of ironic that they do that. Um, I'm sorry, I can't give you more detailed answers about specifics on geology. Um, yeah, so I don't know if anybody else. In my mind, I, I think the, the, the evidence is overwhelming on the other, on the, on the other kind of, uh, uh, at least through through uh, through the science uh, of the of the actual uh, age of the of the planet and and all that. So so in, I have not also there with with some of the kind of uh, scientific evidence uh, uh, of uh, of that kind of uh, uh, very short or or. or 5,000 year history of, of Earth uh, on any, on, in any kind of scientific circles. So I'm I don't even know how that could happen unless you believe, you know, God smushed things together, which, you know, you, you're welcome as, you know, there's theological arguments for that. But just like, you know, the, the only theory for like planet formation is that, you know, little pieces of dust circle a star and then they collide and build up and mm, right. and like i read that it they estimate it grows by in radius 
a few centimeters per year. So the Earth is quite a lot of centimeters. So I think it's more than a thousand times or five thousand years times however many centimeters. So that evidence definitely goes against the I think they call it the young Earth uh, theory. Yeah, what I can say is this is part that I prepared for this lecture, but since we have a very nice and detailed uh, talk by Blagway about cosmology, I will put it for next mm -hmm. session. In general, uh, what I could say, well, we should not be the proponents and insisting on whether it was like short uh, age of the Earth or like longer or whatever, what's the uh, age of uh, also humankind as well. We do not have anything that uh, poses us in such a position that we must uh, insist on whether it's um, like we're older or younger, whatever about that. General, um, like this act of creation up until the creation of the humans is not given uh, in any limitation about the age and or like what in the time scale, like how long it took to God to do that. So there is no need for insistence. Uh, in the way as Protestants, maybe in right. Nicola say in, in, right. in, in, in so whether we say it's like for a million years or like for a um, thousand years does not affect the story given in Genesis. So it's not coming into the conflict at first and second, whether it's uh, even some long time or like whether the days given as six days are real days or like longer days, or like different physics and different time scale let's say, different time measuring, we also cannot say that. It sounds that it might be, oh, how come that it was different physics and different passing of the time in the time and then later it's now as, as we have it right now. I still can say that that's a matter of our fate. We can say maybe it, it is the case. As Blagoy said the same, uh, how come that we have maybe before the fall, the initial uh, sin, like our original sin, original fall, that we have a maybe different way of existence. Yeah, I, I wanted to just want to come back to that because, you know, the irony of the Protestants or whomever argues that, not necessarily Protestants, is like on one hand, they're trying to fit Genesis into some scientific theory if no one else believes it. But on the other hand, they're also completely neglecting the consequences of the fall. Like, that's like I said, you know, the fall is a cosmological event. It breaks creation. Um, and so they're actually completely forgetting that. I mean, I guess maybe they never knew as Protestants, but that's I'm also, I'm sure, an idea in the Catholic tradition. So they're both failing to understand that and also trying to squeeze Genesis into some very unpopular scientific idea. So they're kind of losing on both fronts in some ways, in my opinion. Thank you, Bobby. This is a great point. And so by this moment, maybe we should, it's good. Oh, Nicola, please, uh, if you have another question, please. Or anything. <laughs> anything. Oh, uh, please carry on. I would just uh, to, to, to add another point. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, so, well, uh, let's uh, keep this for the next lecture and let's go on at the, the next Friday at the same time. I will just give this, uh, which I planned for this lecture. It's about uh, evolutionary biology, about uh, geology and about archaeology. And some pros, some pros and cons, whatever. So we will see exactly what we started right now. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all for the participation, for giving so nice discussion and like these things and thank hope you. To see you again next week back and uh even in more audience as well thank All right. you yes. as well for your participation thank you. Thank you. Nice. everybody else Have and i really had bill on earlier and just oh. then he, he left uh, uh at the point. yeah we, we took a, a longer than we expect a longer time so maybe <laughs> let's try next week to be a bit shorter i'll try to comprise this too oh, no it's good it's uh, like minutes. yeah thank you Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.